the King of Coastal Engineers to a very exciting webinar, I believe, about sea level rise dilemmas and uh, in Kurosawa Caribbean and uh, Kurosawa Sapa and Sidrastasius. I'm sorry, I have to get used to the English again. Um, this is going to be a series of three webinars. We have we have had one last week in, in Scotland or Wales, where we also have been looking into their dilemmas and challenges of sea level rise today in the Caribbean. And we haven't set a date yet, but there will also be a webinar probably in September uh, on Fiji, where people have been uh, able to relocate a few settlements. Um, we just had a um, discussion this morning on an email, and they're very willing to uh, to have a little webinar on this one as well. Um, I'll get back to you later on the date, um, so, but I'm guessing somewhere in uh, September. As we are all challenging this sea level rise on the one side and tourism buildings and nature on the other side in everywhere in the, in the, in the world, obviously, uh, we are very interested and very keen on learning on islands that are already facing these challenges. If you compare it to the Netherlands, we still have some time, but uh, other islands are already way ahead of us in all these experiences. So I'm very much looking forward to, to hearing your stories. Uh, we start with Curaçao, Gaspar Lendering will also introduce himself. And after half an hour or so, we will have a very interesting um, talk about from Caroline Gauthier and Michel Ruiter on Sindostasius and Saba. Uh, but we first start with Gaspar. The floor is yours. All right. So um, thank you, Petra. Uh, thank you all for the invitation. Um, very uh, happy to uh, to present something from my uh, from my island. Um, let me just fix the screen here. So is the screen? Uh, so you guys see my screen? Yeah. Yep. Think so. Yes, we can. All right. So um, I will just. I'm not sure how much I can tell you about, uh, let's say, uh, actual large scale mitigation efforts that we are um, doing. Uh, my presentation will mostly be concerning uh, what are our challenges and where and what do I see in terms of challenges in terms of research, but also an adaptation uh, in terms of co uh, coastal adaptation for sea level rise and for also for water conservation. We have a very dry island, um, so water is uh, very important for us uh, on Curacao. Uh, and of course, some beautiful pictures of our beautiful islands for those interested in coming to give us uh, to visit us and uh, bring us some uh, help in these uh, difficult times. Uh, so shortly uh, content, uh, I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about Curacao and our climate. Um, I will tell you about coastal adaptation efforts that have been uh, done in the past and are currently uh, being done. Uh, Water conservation, as I said, eh, we have a very dry island and what I see as our challenges and opportunities. Just a little bit about myself. Um, some of some of you I've met or at least seen in my during my time in the Netherlands. I um, I was born and raised in Curaçao. Um, when I was 18, I moved to the Netherlands to study civil engineering at the University of Delft. Um, and after having completed that with the specialization of hydraulic engineering, I decided to uh, continue my time at the university doing a PhD in flood risk management um, with, uh, at the time, Professor Jonkman just started uh, his uh, seat, his chair at the faculty and uh, me and him uh, yeah, got along well and, we, uh, and I decided to stay for a little bit. Uh, after a few years, I started working for Horvath and Partners, which is an infrastructure consultant in the Netherlands, involved in uh, audit and advice and um, evaluations of big, inf large infrastructure projects in the Netherlands. And um, well, after having lived in the Netherlands for about uh, 13 years, um, about three years ago, I decided to move back to the islands. Um, I was a bit... Uh, tired of not having the sun on my face every day. So we, my wife and I moved to St. Martin, uh, where I started as an independent consultant. At the time, I was also already working for the World Bank for one day a week as a short term consultant for the Bangladesh office, also in terms of for coastal engineering. And I started working as an independent, mostly now working in large construction projects. Uh, I am involved with the St. Martin Medical Center, who is building a new hospital. 
uh, resilient to or built to sustain uh, 200 mile per hour winds and earthquakes, large earthquakes, because it is located on um, St. Martin um, in the middle of the hurricane belt. I know the, our colleagues for today about Synthestatius and Sabo will also uh, talk a little bit about this. Um, and now uh, since last year, April, I moved back to Curaçao, um, the island where, we, where I was born, um, and hoping to contribute to this important uh, topic on the island. But until now, and I will go into that a little bit later, um, I've been working also in construction mostly. Uh, so Curaçao itself, um, I wanted to tell you guys a little bit about the island and about um, uh, its relation to the Netherlands, which is, I think, important for the challenges that uh, that we face. And uh, yeah, maybe um, uh, the, 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 our colleagues from Stacia and Seba can also, uh, yeah, would also benefit from this explanation or at least um, provide some uh, insight in how it works for them. So Curaçao is uh, it's located in the Lesser Antilles in the uh, so in the south of the Carib Caribbean um, right here um, is shown on the map uh, 444 square kilometers and a population of about 150,000 people. Uh, what is fair, what is further important is that we have been reliant on oil and gas industry for a large term of uh, our history until 2018 when the refinery was closed. Uh, Venezuela did not um, is not operating anymore because due to their issues and now we rely I think mostly of tourism. Um, so here a beautiful picture of our inner city and if I go to the next slide you'll see here that most of our city center if this is the island most of our city center and all of our developed areas are located around our port uh, a natural port uh, with a huge inner bay where we where we used to have or where we have the refinery, we used to have a lot of maritime industry, a dry dock, our shipping uh, container uh, terminal, uh, who also feeds uh, used to feed at least the other Dutch Antillean islands, so Simarta, Stacia, and Seba, and uh, Bonaire and Aruba. The blue dot right here is where I'm sitting now, so I'm sitting more to the east of the island, um, also along another inner bay. So just a little bit about our um, uh, relation to the Netherlands. It's a bit difficult, uh, especially since 2010, and it's especially important for the challenges that we face, um, which is why I included this. So the Netherlands consists of, a, we say the kingdom of the Netherlands consists of basically four countries, which is the Netherlands itself as the, as the largest country with the flag here, and the three other countries, Aruba, Curaçao, and St. Martin. Then Bonaire, Stacia and Seba are what we call special municipalities belonging to the country of the Netherlands. Uh, why is this important? Well, Curaçao as an autonomous country, we have our own government, we have our own laws, we have our own tax system and we, in theory, we need to keep, uh, we need to organize everything ourselves. Whereas the islands of Bonaire, Stacia and Seba as special municipalities to the Netherlands are able, they vote for the government of the Netherlands, they do have partly their own tax system, but they have easier access, I should say, to, uh, let's say, aid from an infrastructural point of view. Uh, and that is also why one of the, our challenges is to deal with the fish issues that we're talking about today. If you're more interested in this, there's a very short three minute video on YouTube. I put the link in here and probably the slides will be shared so you can get a little bit more insight in uh, how this actually works. Um, then our climate. Huh? So Curaçao, as I said, we have a, uh, just give me a second. Uh, we have a semi-dry or uh, semi-arid, arid climate. Uh, maximum temperature between 30 and 33 degrees, minimum temperature between 24 and 27 degrees. Annually, we have about 400 to 600 millimeter rainfall, which is in the order of magnitude of what the Netherlands gets, although Hours falls between uh, in much shorter periods. Uh, you, most of you will probably be used to uh, or know of tropical rain showers being very intense in, in a short period. Um, further, we have constant easterly trade winds. Um, so you see here, this our rain, rainy season is uh, somewhere between September and December usually, and uh, the average and the rest of the year is pretty much uh, a dry. Uh, 
dry period. Um, our meteorological service has done uh, investigations of what climate change actually means for the island. Um, and I have included some graphs of this uh, in the presentation. Uh, so firstly, our daily minimum, what we've seen is that our daily minimum temperature, it has been rising uh, over the last years and our daily maximum temperature as well. Um, we do have our meteorological service has a rather um, uh, long data set of temperatures. Uh, although this, the dispersion here, you see quite a lot of dispersion around the, around the, the graph, but I mean, it's safe to say that uh, and, uh, that is becoming uh, Hotter. But I think what is more important to talk about is that um, it's becoming uh, drier as well. So we see an increase of consecutive dry days in the middle graph here. And uh, although there is an increase of total precipitation, so total rainfall, it, it, is, it comes down in shorter periods of time, meaning that we have very few rain days. And, uh, and when, it, when it rains, we see uh, inland flooding pretty quickly. So um, our, let's say our drainage system is uh, is not used to, is not designed to withstand, let's say the amount of rains that uh, we could get. Um, continuing along this line, huh, what does climate change mean for Curaçao? Uh, the other thing, of course, is sea level rise. Um, and I think what is what is presented here also holds for the other uh, for the for all the ABC islands, so Aruba, Bonaire, and Curaçao, um, is that the, the KNME, so the Dutch Meteorological Service, has published uh, very recently that the islands will probably follow the let's say the worldwide um, sea level rise uh, predictions. Um, why is this relevant? Well, depending on where you are on the globe, um, the, the gravity force from uh, the ice caps does it could impact, let's say, how much sea level rise you can expect. So in the, the North Sea, you have more inf influence of the northern sea, uh, ice caps, whereas on the south, uh, the other, the vice versa. But because we are so close to the equator and the difference, the, the distance to both is uh, similar. So north and south, uh, we will follow the, follow the the worldwide uh, predictions. So what they're saying is huh, 30 centimeters sea level rise if global warming is limited to the one and a half degree, about 120 centimeter if we continue at its, at our current pace. I will show you in uh, some graphs uh, a little bit further on what that could mean for Curaçao itself. And the other meteorological point uh, or or let's say threat uh, these islands face in the Caribbean is of course the the tropical cyclones, tropical storms and hurricanes. Uh, luckily on Curaçao we lie, uh, well some say we lie below or we lie outside the hurricane belt, well at least very much to the south. You see here the yellow dot, that's where Curaçao is located and you see that most of the storms pass to the north, pass to the north uh, of our island. If we zoom in a little bit and we talk about what events we have experienced, uh, our meteorological service says that about once every four years, there's a tropical system within 150 kilometers, mostly passing north, and about one in 100 years, we get considerable damage from cyclones. And to the graph on the right, you see a, uh, let's say, a depiction of storms that have passed by close uh, to Curaçao. So this is actually a good, uh, let's say, a good uh, uh, thing for us. Um, we do not experience uh, that much of these uh, of these storms and damages. Um, although with climate change, I am specifically interested to know if uh, if these storm paths tend to change, uh, if everything warms up, um, if we could be more susceptible to these storms. Of course, we are protected. I think by the Venezuelan, uh, by the continental coast, which probably pushes the storms more to the north. Um, but yeah, we I haven't seen specific research, at least not for Curaçao, on this topic. Um, well, as I said, hey, once they say once about once in a hundred years we get a, a significant storm. I think the most, uh, I, I have one here from historical perspective that uh, of which the Dutch, my Dutch colleagues can read in the middle, uh, a uh, paper article which was published in 1977. 
um, talking about the damages uh, of a storm that passed over Kurs on 1877. Um, why did I include this? Well, the area of Peter Mai, which is a part of our city center, is an area I want. I will go into a little bit more at the, later in the presentation um, because it's specifically um, uh, vulnerable to sea level rise. And also here already in 1877, when the hurricane, hurricane Tekla hit Curaçao, there were floods of over two feet throughout this entire city center. There were about 200 deaths, mostly of maritime crew, so ships in the, in the harbor, uh, buildings and livestock uh, damaged and uh, disappeared. Uh, <clears throat> you also see in the storm track that it actually passed directly over Curaçao, so we were located right here to the south. Um, and then something a little bit more recent. Huh? So, as I said, generally we don't have direct hits, but we do experience damages caused by heavy seas and rainfall. So, of the hurricanes, of a hurricane's outer band, uh, the last major storm or hurricane that has passed close to Curaçao was Tropical Storm Thomas on November 1st in 2010, uh, which gave us about 265 millimeters of rain in 24 hours. What we had was large scale power outages, fires in our refinery, um, flood and flood damages of about 65 million US dollars. So total, in total, the damages were about 200 million guilders. We still have a guilder here in Curso, uh, which is all, of, which is about 115 million uh, dollars. And this is mostly mostly inland flooding. Yeah? So these flood damages, it's not not so much coastal flooding. However. If you look at our city center, and this is a video of when when Thomas passed. Sorry about the volume, it's a bit high, but um, you see the waves already hitting over our uh, the key in the inner bay, and basically running into the whole city. So this is some of you might know the the the, the colorful buildings we have that look like Amsterdam. Well, here you see the salt water already intruding in that besides the 265 millimeters of rain that we were experiencing um, at the time. So if I pause this, you see here that this is the outer bands of the hurricane. So even though the cent center of the hurricane may pass well to the north of our island, these systems are so large that we experience quite some heavy weather from these storms. So then, so that's that's a little bit, let's say, about our about our climate and what we're dealing with. Um, I want to, let's say, zoom in a little bit more than on, let's say, coastal adaptation and water conservation on the island. So uh, on the graph you see to the left, you see an uh, image of, let's say, the levels of the island, a topographic map. And uh, to the right, you see uh, that was for the United Nations by the United Nations Office for Project Services did a study together with the Ministry of Transport and Urban Planning in Curaçao of potential impacts of climate change and sea level rise. Um, it's, it's pretty much a simple study where we say what happens if one if we experience one meter sea level rise, one what happens if we experience a four meter storm surge, uh, whether or not we. Uh, our coastline is susceptible to these kinds of storm surge. For me, that is a different topic. I think we have a very steep coastline here in Kelso, so large storm surge uh, caused by wind setup for me is not a realistic scenario. Uh, however, it does provide insight in, let's say, low-lying areas on the island, this, uh, this graph. And you see that most, our most concerning area, again, is around our city, uh, our port here. Um, if you see there for the rest part of the island uh, lies pretty high and our beaches are naturally enclosed bays. So the beaches are vulnerable to the sea level rise. But I, I, let's say in terms of where, where we live on the island, residential areas, uh, the risk is, uh, is, is somewhat lower. But on the other side, our economy relies so much on tourism that having something happen to these beautiful beaches is, of course, not uh, the way to go. So this is the area that I wanted to, let's say, focus on a little bit more, and specifically the area of Peter Mai, which is uh, on my mouse, which is this area right here. Um, and if I 
Uh, firstly, I'm sorry. Firstly, I'm going to go into the port a little bit more. So here you see our inner port and you see a zoomed image of, let's say, the four meter sea level rise around the port itself. If we look at this area right here, this is uh, to give you a better image of what that looks like. This is our container shipping terminal and our dry dock, which is which is where Damon, a Dutch uh, shipbuilder, uh, took over the shipyard about four or five years ago. Uh, you see all around that these areas are not very high compared to sea level, and this is also shown, of course, in this in this graph. Um, if we zoom into the area of Peter Mai, which is the area where the hurricane hit uh, of 1877, you see here, you see that already uh, on certain days when we have uh, high tide on the figure to the left, that the water is about five or ten. Yeah, you. You can guess here about five or ten centimeters below our uh, our key wall or road. Uh, notice here also that our our tide is limited to about a, a daily uh, a daily difference of thirty centimeters and an annual of ninety centimeters. So it's not a lot. Um, so also at at low tide we are thirty centimeters below this key wall. This specific area here is a very important area in terms of tourist development. It's full of restaurants. It's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. It's full of restaurants, apartments, hotels, government buildings and other businesses. And uh, historically, there was a centralized sewage system which basically. Feeded our sewage water into the into the sea with all of its impacts as well, but that's a different uh, <laughs> topic. Um, so you can imagine if you do something surrounding this area, the water will probably come from below as well into the sewage system. So it's quite it can become quite a, a difficult situation. If you look at the, in terms of what the actual levels mean, eh, it's still pretty OK with in terms of uh, in terms of height. Eh, it's a very it, it is a very rough grid. It is, I must say, but um, you see this is, I think, from my if I look at our, our full coast, this is the area that is most vulnerable. And what is our, so what are we actually doing here? And that's, I think that's what, what everybody in terms of coastal engineers is, of course, interested in. Well, as I said, um, specifically now, after the COVID uh, hit our islands, um, we do not have the means to invest in long term type of infrastructure dealing with this with these issues. The urgency is not there and the priority is not there. Uh, Curacao faces uh, poverty, still still faces poverty. We are coming back from a corona crisis where over large periods of time we did not have any tourists on the island, full lockdowns and any so any, um, let's say, projects in terms of uh, dealing with climate change and coastal uh, erosion have been put on the on the long term. Um, furthermore, I told you a little bit our, of our relations in the Netherlands with the Netherlands. Um, it's always been a difficult one. And um, for me, person, from a personal point of view, when we did the referendum to choose what kind of relation we would need with the Netherlands, I was always for a, the similar relation that Bonaire Station and Seba have. But the island shows differently at the time I was also 16. That was when the referendum was held. Um, and it has certain consequences for for this type of thing, because say banks, we, we see more development in terms of infrastructure on the. On the special munis municipality islands than we do here. What do we see here? Uh, I've spoken to government officials and uh, those involved and private developers. Um, we more we see more and more, let's say, public private partnerships. Huh? So where the normally the high tide line is. Uh, the, the, the properties are sold up until the high tide line and everything uh, further on is government owned land if, uh, when it's underwater. So what happens when developers need to reinforce their coastline? They uh, sometimes the deals are made beforehand, but oftentimes the deals are made after the fact. Uh, the they reinforce their coastline like we see in this area here um, and then try to deal with the government in terms of being able to use that land that they've basically reclaimed from the sea. 
you see you see that the original coastline here was lying at least uh, at, this is about I think 20 30 meters at least 30 meters more inland and also threatening let's say this these buildings over here um, if we look at building codes uh, I've also looked at our building codes uh, we still have a building code dating from 1935 sometimes and you can imagine those not having any kind of uh, setback requirements or special purpose ordinances for floodplain management etc so i think it's pretty we're faced with pretty challenge pretty much challenging uh, things in this in this terms of uh, in this topic if we look at other other areas on the island um especially along our south coast so here on the back you see the refinery i was talking about so we're a little bit more to the east of where we were just now so this is let's say the peter my area and we're mid more to the east um early 1990s um in this area there was a landfill but a certain visionaire and we, we even call him dutch on the island his name is dutch he built a huge beach uh with the help of dutch dredgers along this whole part and it was basically a, a trial and error kind of effort where he built offshore breakwaters to be able to build a beach there because the sea in that specific area is pretty rough so beaches would not would not stay and um and started developing the area and he built the curse of sea aquarium there a hotel on on offshore island and uh, all kinds of other developments so nowadays th this area looks like this so we have a beautiful beach here uh behind an offshore breakwater and uh quite some hotels restaurants uh businesses etc located behind um, the famous uh, let's say the famous van der Valk family uh, from the Netherlands also has a huge hotel there and is expanding and I've seen the site and they built yeah I, if I I'm guessing one 1.5 meter above the current sea level with the ground floor so what why do I say this is because these these uh, developments get permits um, and without any centralized requirements of ground for level setback requirements or anything along the sea, along the coast, um, and welcoming these types of development because we need tourism, um, means that we are in fact creating challenges for the future, um, in my view. And if you see here also, I said earlier, our coast is pretty steep, meaning that uh, our drop off is here and that drop off usually goes to not not to 10 20 meters but it can go straight pr pretty quick to 100 meters so it's not like we can have we have a lot of space to move uh, to create more land in front of our current existing hotels um yeah, so that was a bit about the coastal adaptation efforts uh, or the challenges we face. Uh, I also wanted to touch a little bit on uh, Curacao's dry climate and what that actually means for us. Um, so in the in the table here uh, and in the graph, like I said earlier, we have uh, we are expecting an increase of consecutive dry days on the island. Curacao experiences quite some has experienced quite some times where uh, periods of drought. Um, with very limited rainfall and if you look at what that actually how that looks like on the island here you see a picture to your left and to your right of uh, the western part of Ireland in a right in a rainy season and in a dry season so this is typical to uh, and and I'm I'm used to Curacao looking more like uh, a little bit the, the graph to your right rather than the graph to your left um, so what does that actually mean for us well Curacao as one of the is one of the few I think islands in the Caribbean which has the at least in the Dutch Caribbean which has the luxury of groundwater. And we have uh, we have a quite a large groundwater table in the island. Um, unfortunately, we do not use that water for drinking water. We do we use reverse osmosis to to obtain drinking water, but we do use it for agriculture and. Our good friends from the Netherlands built uh, in the early 1900s, built over 1500 hydraulic dams on the island for water conservation. So historically, the island has a well-functioning system of dams. Uh, the largest had a capacity of 600,000 tons. The second largest, 450,000 tons, which, which is the one on the picture here, including its spillway. 
And these are traditionally yeah, Dutch uh, uh, structures um, and, and have been provided uh, a lot of uh, advantages for our agriculture sector, agriculture uh, for the sector, for the island. Uh, if you look, for example, here, um, the, the dam I was showing you the picture of, including its spillway, is already painted or uh, depicted on a um, graph of Curaçao, and this graph is from about 19, somewhere between 1911 and 1915, the left graphs maps were made. And you see that here, you see the watershed coming down, the blue, the blue line, and here the water, line, water lines. Everything was painted on these, on these graphs. So you can imagine this being a very important infrastructure for the island, for a very dry island like Curso. Um, on with, incre and, uh, with increasing number of dry days and more extreme events, the need for this infrastructure for us is very important. Huh? As you see, another example to your left here, a dam, the area behind the dam which is dry and the area behind the dam where it is containing the water. Um, unfortunately, in the last, let's say, decades, um, with uh, limited financial uh, uh, money and attention, I should say, um, we've yeah we've basically had let let these dams uh, deteriorate deteriorate a little bit. The largest ones are still being maintained. I've spoken to uh, our government officials, but if when you speak to them, you you sometimes see people that are a bit uh, at a loss of energy because, yeah, they want so much and we need so much, but yeah, we see things uh, moving in the wrong direction. Fortunately, Curso has uh, we we use um, it's still very expensive. We use water for our we use um, seawater and reverse osmosis to have drinking water, and our drinking water and all of our grey water from our houses usually go in what we call beerputten. I'm not sure. We we basically dig a hole in our yard and we let the water seep into the ground. And this is nowadays feeding our groundwater level. So luckily, with our system of dams move, uh, getting less attention, we are still feeding it. The question is how contaminated the water is. And there's also somebody doing research on that, but uh, it's not like we're losing everything. I think that's important to note. But um, yeah, I should say it's not a very encouraging image. Yeah, so this basically gives you an idea of what that looks like. Yeah? We see dams here uh, where the transitions are are not maintained. Um, I've here heard storage about seepage, uh, piping going under the dams, under low tide. And uh, if you look at the systems feeding the dams, so the, the watersheds themselves, um, they are not being maintained either. So the pictures to your right are actually from about uh, three or four weeks ago where we had a big main rainfall event here. I was driving around myself, so excuse the bad <laughs> pictures, but you see so you see that we have vegetation growing inside these drainage channels, which is obviously not uh, helpful in terms of flash flooding events. And well, this is what you get, eh? so uh, if we're in with a major event, so we get uh, flash floods events. So if I summarize, uh, so this is basically what I wanted to talk to you a little bit about. And if I summarize, uh, what are our areas of interest on the coastal zone? Uh, I would be specifically interested in prediction of sea level rise, but and are hurricanes actually changing in terms of their paths? Um, what mitigations can we do for our city center? Um, and I think that's not only uh, structural, but how to talk about building codes, coastal zone planning, and setback criteria for private developments. Uh, what are our areas of interest for inland flooding? I think we should look at our water conservation infrastructure to avoid it being lost complete, completely. And I would, uh, I'm trying to set up a, uh, a partnership with the University of Delft to have some students look at our watershed, update the modeling of them, and let's say look from a risk point of view where um we have risk for inland flooding and then uh, and, and if we need to do something about the dams as well itself yeah what is the biggest challenge i think is not to lose historical knowledge i mean if we have a system of dams that has been there since the early 1900s 
it's not a, it's not a question of something becoming important because of climate change, but something that is just evidently for the island. Um, and finding funding, of course. Um, like I said, locally, that is our, uh, our biggest challenge. And uh, there are some efforts which I wanted to close with. Uh, two, uh, two more efforts, if you will, if you'll uh, let me. Recently, there was the Curacao Climate Change Platform set up, uh, which who identified pretty steep, inter if I look at it, uh, uh, goals. So by 2030 and eight years, Curacao will be resilient to the adverse impacts of natural hazards and the losses of biodiversity due to climate change and a key player in renewable energy. If we look at water security, uh, water safety, this means that the risk of flooding, coastal flooding, coastal erosion and drought will be sustainably managed to a nationally accepted level. Um, how do we do this on Curacao? Well, the Curacao Meteorological Service has basically set up expert teams uh, who come together to talk about these issues, to try and see what we need to do. Uh, but at the moment, this is still, uh, excuse, excuse my maybe sarcasm, but this is still talking a lot and not so much doing. So I'd be very interested in how other colleagues on islands actually get things done, maybe who deal with the same issues that we uh, that we face. <clears throat> Lastly, for nature, I saw nature coming back at, at the presentation of this uh, of this uh, uh, webinar. Also. Um, there is our Karmabi, our natural um, uh, an organization looking into the impacts of on coral reefs, did receive funding for a large uh, initiative to look at how land derives and waterborne inputs affect the growth and survival of coral reefs. This is not only for Curacao, but also for Bonaire. So in the picture uh, in the sea here, this is Bonaire with a large rain uh, runoff event. Uh, and the top two pictures are actually the sewage lines coming out of the city center for, from Curacao, displaying or dispersing gray water into the area. So I'm happy to say that on this topic, we have some attention, and I think that is the way to move forward for us to create, uh, to get EU funding for research. And I am happy to talk about, uh, with colleagues from the Netherlands, to talk about any way we can together maybe uh, do this. Yeah, this was my presentation, so I hope uh, I hope you found it a little bit interesting. <laughs> and um, yeah, Peter, maybe you can uh, take over again, or maybe I can happy to take some questions. Uh, just yeah, let me know. That? Are there any questions for Casper so far? Very quick questions. Myself, I have one at least. So we were talking about UNESCO World Heritage locations. Um, Maybe I'm naive, but there should be some funding somewhere then. Uh, yes, you would expect uh, that. Um, but I think the urgency of the pri priority is not there. So the, the lady that actually heads our local UNESCO World Heritage Site uh, office actually herself gave a presentation at the Curacao Climate Change Platform um, explaining what funding there is available in the EU and in the Netherlands for this type of research and inviting all those present to go, to look into those options and write proposals. So if things go move in that direction, yeah, then I'm a bit hesitant to hear if she herself is making those efforts. Um, right, yes. Yeah. Unfortunately so. And if you, if you have this quite steep goals for 2030, well, that's seven and a half years from now, um, how how do you going? How is the island going to achieve those things? So well, that was my this was my this was my main question at the platform itself, and I until today I do not have answers. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I was a bit sarcastic was when I presented it because it's a it's a very steep goal, and I think it's good that we put together all our experts to talk about these issues, but we should also have those experts set the goals in, instead of vice versa. Because this is not, this, yeah, this is not realistic for me. Yeah. yeah. See if you can help by building a com community to to help you. Something. Get some more awareness. Yeah. 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 Is, yeah. It, is there any questions from the audience now, at this moment? Um. Yes. Who? Somebody. Joyce. Yes. 
You're muted, you're on... so can't yeah. hear you. No, sorry. Uh -uh. Now it should be off mute, but apparently your mic is not working, maybe. Maybe not a question in between. Ayan, do you have a question or are you just waving to us? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I was just waving, but I do have a question, yes. Um, I was just wondering, um, as we have in the Netherlands a kind of uh, policy to protect our coastline, I didn't hear that uh, Curaçao has a policy to protect its coastline in what way um so it's all down to uh individual or or uh, um yeah individuals yeah, to so do something is it it is yeah so i um here the, the the difference between let's say the special municip municipalities and the other islands come into play because the dutch policies for the coastline are actually vig also for those islands and mm. I've seen studies where Dutch uh, uh, consultants or Rex Waterstaart or whoever has has investigated what implications those policies have for those islands. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, um, due to our relation to the Netherlands, we do not have. Firstly, the Dutch policies are not governing here, and secondly, we do not have such policy. We ourselves we haven't uh, developed one. Um, okay. Actually, the, the day before yesterday, I sat with. Um, the uh, SK from the Ministry of uh, Trans Infrastructure, Transport and Planning, so the highest, uh, the highest uh, Amtenaar. She showed me a vision that she has on the coastline, mm -hmm. but but she actually told me that we cannot uh, publish such things at the moment because it may um, cause private developers to cause some problems with private developers because yes. you're, you, may, you may propose stuff in front of their properties, huh? mm -hmm. which causes their properties or beaches or whatever to have impacts. So it's a, and that's one of the main issues that she's experiencing because yeah, how do you, how do you then go about implementing such things where tourism is so important for the island? Yeah. So you cannot even draw a, a future plans or developments on what what will uh, uh, 10, 20, 30 centimeters of, of, of sea level rise cause or what areas will be at risk at what in what year. Um, you, yeah. you can't draw any uh, visions on that. So it's very hard to um, then do anything. Um, it is, yeah. Well, I think in terms of drawing what the impacts can be, we can uh, definitely do that and we can mm -hmm. definitely investigate what the impacts is around our coastline. But I think most of these developers already know this. And, um, so it's all um, about communication and awareness then maybe. And, uh, yeah, and urgency. I mean, I, from a government point of view, it's more urgency. I mean, our, 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 yeah, our government is, yeah, a very short term looking, looking at the next term of uh, when they get reelected, um, looking to, I mean, we drive on roads with potholes everywhere. So our challenges in terms of infrastructure, the, the, the question if we then invest in our coastline and then uh, and then 90% of the islands say, well, every every uh, year I have to change the suspension of my car. I mean, that's it's also a trade off uh, in what we're doing. Um, Very big challenge that you are having on the island. Then. And some are actually no. quite recognizable if you talk about short term politicians periods, mm -hmm. but also mm -hmm. draw sets coming up. But I would like to switch to uh, Saba's and the Stasis now, just for uh, for our time uh, yep. management a little bit. Thank you very much, Kasper. And maybe we get back to you with some questions later on. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine that we have a discussion later that can be very comparable to, to both three islands. Um, so welcome Caroline, or Caroline, Caroline, I'm not sure, and Michelle. The uh, floor is yours. Hi, uh, thank you. Uh, I'll share my screen to start with. Um, yes, can you hear me and can you see the screen? Yes. That's fine. Yes. Um, okay, yeah, we are uh, here with uh, two of us. Um, that's uh, me, Catherine Gauthier, working uh, for Deltares, and it's um, Michel Ruiter, working for Rijkswaterstaat, and we are both involved in uh, Sint Eustatius. 
Ja. Um, well, Sintestage en Saba uh, are two special uh, Dutch municipalities, as you uh, now know, uh, two pearls in the Caribbean Sea. Well, of course, there's sea, there's tide, there's waves out there, but the conditions are quite different from, uh, from our European situation here. And uh, well, Michel and I, uh, we will take you the following 20 minutes to the Caribbean and, and show you what we are working on and how we in Europe can benefit from those Caribbean experiences. Um, we will go from some brief history via coastline development to the use and the needs for monitoring and also uh, show, show you some results uh, of the modeling. Um, yeah, uh, first, yeah, quick overview of, of where we are. You've seen this, uh, this plot before, but um, Saba and Sint Eustatius, or uh, Stasia in, uh, in English, uh, they're um, located in, in the circle, um, two small uh, volcanic islands, and yeah, they have two to 3,000 inhabitants each. Uh, yeah, you can see that the islands are really uh, small, just a few kilometers. Uh, most people uh, live on the higher ground, so there's no direct risk uh, from the sea, but uh, in the vicinity of the harbors with economic activities and, and the coastal roads, uh, those are obviously uh, lying uh, lower. Um, there are uh, a few uh, current projects going on where the Rijkswaterstaat uh, is involved. Uh, for Saba, uh, there's a, a new port being uh, built, so it's actually a shift from the old port older port uh, to, uh, to provide more inland space. Uh, and Ex-Waterstaat also carries out uh, hydraulic measurements for, for water levels, waves, and also weather and some other parameters. Um, at Stasia, uh, the, the breakwater of the, of the harbor is, is being extended. Um, and there's also a wave climate study going on for the area near the harbor and the, and the coastal road. Uh, and there's a study uh, for possibilities for, for beach nourishment. Uh, and also at, at Stasia, uh, there is a, a measuring campaign um, for water levels, waves, and a few other parameters. Uh, today's focus here will be uh, mainly on the, on the monitoring and the modeling. Oh. Um, yeah. Um, ik geloof dat ik het even over mag nemen. Um, nou, Sint Eustatius, uh, uh, Sint small island, Caribbean, uh, a very rich island in the second half of the 18th century. Uh, it was one of the richest in the world. It was called the Golden Rock. And it was so immensely rich that uh, the English took it over. Uh, as you can see on this screen, uh, nowadays figures are very uh, limited compared to the old days. Uh, they had a, around uh, 3,500 ships per year, uh, an enormous export of sugar that was not uh, uh, cultivated on the island, uh, but more uh, imported and re-exported. Um, and also at that time, uh, Sinterstatius was the biggest supplier of uh, military goods for the uh, American independence uh, uh, war. Uh, you see that being extremely rich also means that uh, we have a large number of maps, drawings and history of the island. This is a map showing uh, the situation in 1780, uh, just when the British took it over. Uh, all parts of the island were used, more, more than 8,000 people were living there, and nowadays it's about 2,000 people. Um, part of that richness is also shown on this map. Uh, the economic uh, most important area, uh, it was the coastal area, was built full of uh, warehouses. Um, and this is an English map, and uh, it's also showing that it was extremely wealthy. Um, having so much maps brings us to the next part, uh, coastline development and sea level rise. Um, 
being rich means that you have to defend your island and um, well, even in those times, uh, those uh, fortifications were um, organized and uh, discussed and maps were drawn for new uh, reinforcements. And one of the reinforcements was a, um, a reinforcement called uh, the Battery of Bui. On this map, you see the um, uh, cistern. Cistern is uh, just a well located near the shore. And actually, this location still exists, and even the battery exists. If we project the current coastline on it, you see that same well, well, I don't know, located over here. Distance to the shore is almost the same as it was 250 years ago. So the island is quite stable in respect of its coastline. Uh, the fortification that was can be seen over here. And if we zoom in on that fortification, you can even see that what was planned is also built at that time and is still recognizable today. Even the two cannons are still there. Um, that coastline stability um, can also be reflected in the topographical maps. This is a topographical map of the um, well, early of the last century. All the orange dots are the remnants of the warehouses that were ruins, ruins already at that time. And even on this map, we can draw the current coastline. And then we see that some changes are visible, but uh, the main features are still the same. The the coastline is still very close to those uh, ruins. And um, the coastline has been very um, resilient and stable. Um, well, changes did occur and do occur. Uh, we have a beach that is sometimes present, as can be seen on the um, picture on the upper left side. Um, and that beach can disappear as well. That's partly seasonal effect, partly um, effects that occur once every decade. In the um, KLM uh, Aerocarto survey of the 60s, the beach can still be clearly seen. And if we take the same Aerocarto map of 1991, it's gone. And if we well, we do not present it over here, but if we take the, the current situation, then the beach is also not there. But also the stories from the history um, indicate that that beach uh, width will fluctuate. Well, we are working on uh, various new projects, and for those new projects, um, we are trying to um, obtain enough information for the design and for the um, uh, validation of our design. And we did a lot of monitoring last year. Um, as can be seen on these pictures, um, both weather, uh, waves, currents, and water levels. Um, well, of, of those water levels, I will show you a few interesting things. Um, we have created um, a tide gauge or water level point in the harbor of Stasia and also in Seba. We did it quite simple with a pressure gauge and those pressure gauges have the advantage that they um, can be used for tide, but also can measure the wave height within your harbor. Um, if we look in those uh, tidal conditions and just a little, uh, focus a little bit on what we see in uh, the Caribbean compared to our Dutch situation. Uh, this is a, a record from uh, Seba, where we do it uh, also. You can see that the spring tidal conditions are um, characterized by having one high water and high, one low water during a day. And if we go more to the neap tide conditions, we see that it is a double high water and double low water. Uh, for SEBA, we did those measurements already for three years. 
um, the advantage of having a long period uh, title record is that you can get an indication on how your sea level uh, varies during the years, but also uh, during the months. And this is an analysis based on a monthly analysis or two weekly analysis, basically. What you see is that um, uh, during the hurricane season, uh, that's the month of August until November, uh, then the water levels are the highest. It's basically related to the low pressure area in the Caribbean region um, and in the Atlantic. Uh, during the uh, during our winter months, um, the water level drops, and um, then we have the lowest water levels. And this pattern with a with a difference of approximately 20 centimeters is seen every year. Um, we can also average in uh, on a daily pattern. Um, and then you can see that uh, for Saba, that if you go to a specific hour of the day, that uh, there's still a, a kind of daily pattern visible. That is an, uh, the average water level during uh, daytime between 12 and 15 hours is lower than the average water level during the morning or in the evening. That's something we also see in the Netherlands, however. Um, well, this is about tight. Um, for the waves, I will give the floor to my colleague. Uh, yes. Um, well, the wave conditions uh, at Stasia are in, in general uh, rather mild, uh, but hurricanes can occur, resulting in, in wave heights well above 10 meter at deep water. Um, and during hurricanes, uh, yeah, proper wave forecasts from dedicated models can help to evacuate and uh, prevent damage. Uh, also, in uh, in less severe conditions, um, which are not related to hurricanes, wave forecasts can be very useful. And besides providing forecasts, a wave model can also be used for for long hindcasts, so that you can um, uh, yeah assess a wave climate, which can be used to uh, derive design conditions. Um, so therefore, we we set up this this wave model. Um, the lower left. Uh, plot, uh, the, the pink area is the domain uh, which was covered by the wave model. And um, well, the very small uh, gray part is is, uh, is plotted above, um, where you recognize uh, Saba and Stasia, which are some 30 kilometers away from each other. Um, and there you see also in that upper plot uh, some uh, markers which indicate the, the observations. Um, it's uh, for Saba. There's one uh, wave view, buoy, and uh, uh, weather observations. And Stasia, there's even uh, four um, instruments to measure the waves, and and also uh, a weather instrument. So um, um, yeah, those observations provide uh, valuable uh, data to validate the models. Um, yeah, we also set a set wave model up for um, a long. 40-year hindcast, and therefore we used uh, uh, ECMWF from the European uh, Weather uh, Center. Uh, so ECMWF, wind and, uh, and boundary conditions. Um, yeah, just some examples of, of what comes out from uh, from the model. Uh, the wave situation is quite complex at, at Stasia's west coast because uh, uh, waves mainly coming from the east, bend around the island. Uh, the time series in the middle plot, they uh, show you that the 40 years of wave near Stasia. Uh, yeah, you can see it. It's often around one meter, so it's rather mild. But the peaks are the yeah the hurricanes or the, the storm situations. Um, the upper right uh, uh, plot shows you the, the wave heights during a hurricane. That, that was Irma in 2017, uh, of which St. Martin uh, still is not, uh, not fully recovered. Um, but you can see that, that Stasia and Saba, they were hardly hit by Irma. It's really uh, yeah, past um, more north. Uh, the lower plots, they uh, show uh, how the model um, uh, how well the model uh, simulates the, the observations. So the, the observations provide valuable uh, 
validation data there. Um, yeah, here you see uh, how the, the, the waves passed uh, when, when Irma, that hurricane uh, came along. Um, yeah, you see that uh, the track was, was rather northern and, and uh, Stasia and Saba were, were more or less saved. But uh, yeah, such a track can also uh, take a more southern uh, um, path. Yeah, so that uh, um, those very high waves could also uh, happen on the other islands. A uh, whole uh, different situation is, is here. So uh, there was, was no uh, severe wind involved. Uh, it was rather uh, mild, but the waves were high and especially very long. And uh, those long swells, they, they persisted for a couple of days and they were even so yeah, high and long that, that the harbor could not be used. And yeah, that was a situation with a lot of concern for the, for the people who are very, uh, um, yeah, um, dependent on, on the on import and on the harbor. So uh, it would help if, if this kind of situations uh, could be forecasted as well. Uh, another example of, of the wave model output is, is here uh, with, with wave roses on, on any location uh, and also for, for the different months. And yeah, when you have this model, you can uh, compute them for, for, uh, for yeah, the place wherever you like, and they are based on 40 years of, uh, of hindcast data. And this kind of information uh, can be used as, as input for the coastline evaluation studies. Um, that bring, brings us to uh, the monitoring benefits. Oh, that's for me? Yes. Um, monitoring benefits. Um, well, the Benefits that, uh, as we see it, is that uh, the Caribbean offers us, um, if you look at it from the Dutch perspective, um, a situation where we can have and uh, monitor conditions uh, that are the design conditions for the North Sea. Every five to ten years, we have hurricanes in the Caribbean, and we have an extreme conditions uh, for um, uh, wave but also for um, monitoring and modeling. So uh, we can learn from those extreme conditions if we predict them correctly and if we can measure them correctly. Um, well, we also have seen that the field work that we have done so far um, helped us in the design of um, the breakwater in Seba and Sintostasius. Uh, for example, on beforehand, uh, we assumed that we uh, that the surge during um, uh, winds and uh, tropical uh, depression uh, would be around uh, one to one half meter. But um, so far, and especially on Saiba, we had uh, one tropical depression passing by. We've seen that, that those surges, those measured surges were hardly present. They were in the order of 10 to 15 centimeters maximum. Um, and uh, further, we see that um, although the feeling was that Emma and Maria were uh, quite extreme, um, also for Seba and Stasia, that it is basically uh, in, in respect of waves, um, not an extreme condition. And well, you only can draw such a conclusion if you have long term hindcast uh, executed. Well, I think we can go to the yes. next slide. Um, well, the so our summary and it's focusing on uh, the field work and on uh, modeling and um, uh, measurements is that um, field work and measurements um, are essential. Uh, for a good understanding of your uh, local area and also essential for your um, um, for your uh, numerical modeling. And well, the last uh, statement that you preferably should um, join forces when you are executing your um, monitoring campaign campaign and your um, 
your modeling campaign. Uh, and I think that it uh, accounts for every uh, project that if you are um, uh, designing a dike, it's good to have your local knowledge and to go into the field and feel what kind of uh, ground or clay you are using to build your dike. Uh, but that also accounts for um, the work we do in the, um, in the Carib Caribbean islands. Um, and that's basically, um, I think, our prestation. Uh, Petra, neem jij het over? Yeah, yeah, many thanks, uh, Caroline and Michelle, for a very interesting uh, presentation. Um, I have a question. How do you... How does these, all these insights that you have gained with all this modeling uh, led to a different approach on oh, later even. planning, maybe? Ah, that's easier. Now we can see each other a bit better. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Did, did, it lead, did these new insights lead to actual new planning? Like you've, you've seen before on Curacao that people are, are building on the coast, on the very low-lying coasts. Does these insights help you to have new and better designs uh, on the coast of Saba and Stasia? Well, uh, I think that our main conclusion for now is that um, at present we do not uh, see any effects of sea level rise. Mm -hmm. And of course they will, uh, uh, they will eventually be there. Um, what we do in Stasia is to uh, have a long-term planning uh, in, in respect of the harbor. The harbor is constructed in a low-laying area where we have a limited um, space for expansion and a limited uh, space for storing um, containers, for example. So we have done um, a kind of study to see uh, what will we do in the future if sea level arrives. So that's a long-term planning. Uh, in respect of safety, um, there are limited uh, risks. Uh, everybody is living uh, well above sea, uh, sea level. Um, and uh, the present infrastructure will function uh, with a sea level rise up to a half meter higher than it is now. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, I think so, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you also have tourist sites or beaches where next to the harbour maybe that might be interested in all your results. I see Joyce nodding. <laughs> well, uh, we are presently working on that to see um, how we can... Uh, there's a natural process uh, with the beaches that are present or that um, are eroded. That's a natural uh, process. and what we are aiming at is to assist that process with adding sand to the system to have a little bit more robust um, uh, beaches uh, at the location but that is still in a in a stage that we are uh, designing and studying on yeah, very uh, interesting. But do we have to ask you the question in a year from now well we we are stay doing it step by step we have We've done our wave modeling. We have done our uh, beach survey. We have done our um, bathymetrical survey of the of the of the foreshore. We have uh, gathered information on the sands available, um, and now we are in the process of uh, bringing it further to an actual design and an actual pilot phase in creating a, a larger beach. And. I remember Joyce women uh, talking about that you also have a coinciding problem like fluvial erosion and also uh, coastal erosion near the airport. Can you talk about that a little bit also, or is that too early? No. Is it too well, early? that is that, that is not not too early. The the erosion on the that's the other side of the island is the northern side. That's more uh, rainfall related erosion. That's a sort of gully erosion where a uh, large amount of rains um, um, yeah, leaves the shore and creates a gully. Mm -hmm. And we are working on that as well to, um, to enhance the infiltration in the subsoil by uh, creating, um, how do you call them, um, infiltration areas and to have um, uh, to prevent 
uh, that the, those large streams have their eroding force uh, and um, yeah, um, in, in that way we are trying to prevent those uh, further erosion on the northern side. Yeah. But there are very local specific erosion spots. Yeah. Yeah, but I think. Uh, do you hear me now, everybody? Yeah. Uh, okay. Luckily, sorry that my microphone didn't work earlier. Um, I think it's very interesting that what what, what Kasper was presenting earlier that with this project near the airport. Uh, with the more like erosion that's caused by rainfall, we are also trying to, well, um, uh, get the rainwater to use it for agricultural uh, purposes in the future. So we're trying to make a win-win of preventing erosion, but uh, uh, yeah, combine uh, several projects to also, well, use the water uh, in, in a positive way. And uh, as Michel said, that it's, we are doing different projects uh, on the islands uh, uh, for Stasia and also with the harbor projects and with beach nourishment uh, development that we are uh, researching now with Delta Aros, uh, we try to make a win-win, uh, but we are overviewing everything from the data we are analyzing now with the wave climate. Uh, with models, with beach nourishment, and that's quite interesting to combine uh, different kind of projects uh, to, well, hopefully uh, benefit uh, the local situation of uh, uh, syndestasius. Thank you. Thank you very much. And how about the awareness of, uh, I don't know, maybe the developers or the entrepreneurs on the beach or inhabitants? What do you mean exactly with this question, Petra? Uh, well, like you said, in Curaçao, the, the people are developing on um, locations that are maybe not the best uh, for, if you're related to water management, either for now or for the future. Um, does this kind of awareness is also a problem at Saba and Sunda stations? Well, I think at this moment now, we are, uh, we are very busy with analysis and with the modeling of beach nourishment with uh, the, the studies that Michel and Caroline just presented. And we are combining this in the couple of months with uh, uh, modules uh, uh, study and also uh, with a student of uh, the University of Delft. And we hope to present an advice uh, in the end of this year uh, to, uh, to Stasia if, if beach nourishment is a go or no go. But is it uh, um, is it a good investment or not? Uh, so we are we are uh, busy working on that, uh, Petra. Okay, so that will be the next phase then. Maybe. Yeah, and 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 from that uh, advice, then the uh, well, uh, Stasia can decide if they want to go on with it, and also communicate to the local stakeholders about it. And uh, to add to add to that, uh, Stasia is a little bit more. Um, is easier than Curacao. Uh, the coastline in Stasia is, um, uh, is shallow. Uh, there's, uh, there's loads of sand available. So that makes it easier um, um, to adapt your coastal situation for sea level rise. Although um, I, th I think we can, um, we can adapt to a, approximately a half meter of sea level rise. Yeah? So hopefully we can keep it with them. Yeah, this is uh, just to add, this is very true in terms of sand being available for Curso. The beach that I showed in my presentation, Sea Aquarium Beach, was built, built by the Dutch dredgers. Uh, they took the sand from a northern area uh, near to the St. Joris Inner Bay. Uh, my father actually worked 20 years for Van Oort, and they've been trying to ask the dredger, the Dutch dredgers to get some more sand from that area, but they don't want to come to go because it's too close to the shore. So it's, there's no, we don't have any, let's say large uh, areas to reclaim more sand because the rest of the shoreline is so steep. No. Yeah, you have to go to Aruba uh, problem. Yeah, we, uh, yeah, Aruba exactly. Yeah. exactly, yeah. Aruba has a lot, I know. Quite a challenging uh, transport. And problem. then it becomes yeah, well, that's, then it that's, becomes very costly, yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah that, that's quite challenging, and that's yeah. What 
that's why we, we are also searching, okay, if we are going to go on with the harbor project, can we combine the sands also for the long term that you have to dredge your harbor once in a while? Can we use it to maintain the beach nourishment? So we, we are working on this also in the co next couple of months to maybe see if there is a win-win in that scenario. Very wise, also carbon emission wise. <laughs> <laughs> So any other questions from the audience, maybe? Uh, maybe more of a statement that I'm jealous of the Bonaire Stacia Seba Islands with their research. <laughs> <laughs> you have to uh, relocate yourself again, Casper. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I've lived on, uh, yeah, I've lived on a few islands already, but uh, this is my home island still. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've I've been there for about ten years, Curacao. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. I think this. Uh, I want to give some credits to Michel because this is really one thing that is really uh, he's accountable for this. Also for Station and Seba, and with the help of Caroline from Deltaus, measuring is knowing, and it's up to people that really know. We have to invest in measurements for also the long term to make strategic decisions. And Michel well made that statement. He said it's important, and so yeah, I think that's. Um, and also this this kind of presentations we have to learn from each other and I hope also with monitoring yeah that we can also uh, improve that for the for the islands in the future that's a very nice word nice. yeah <laughs> now we, maybe we should hire Michelle also for Curacao then <laughs> maybe <laughs> uh, Katalina well, you raise your hand also for a question I think. yeah I, I had a question on the the, the, the beach nourishment and, and there was plenty of sediment, but it was, I might be confusing islands, I'm not sure, but it was also this worry about stopping pluvial erosion, but are you not negatively impacting possibly the coastal sediment budget or is that amount neglectable to, I don't know where the sand comes from in the near shore, maybe that's my question. I don't know the local area at all, so I was just uh, wondering. Well, for Stacia, it's, it's, um, uh, the amount of say, sediments of sand available is, is quite large. Yeah? And uh, beaches have been there uh, in the past and uh, will remain there. Um, and um, I think that if you go from the coast to the deeper water, uh, that, that it will take you approximately 5 to 10 kilometers. Uh, the first coastal stretch is uh, going in uh, one in 40, one in 50 uh, downwards. And it's all sandy. And that's also basically the reason why, why it was so prosperous in the, in the past. It was an excellent anchoring ground. Uh, it was in, um, in uh, well, the island itself was protecting the ships that were anchored, so. Okay. So the fluvial sand was not really needed. So, but I think it was. No, it was. Uh, yeah. So, so if s somewhere in the in the history. I mean, I don't know what the source of all the sediment is in the near shore, but it's there. It's 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 not a narrow strip. So that's indeed. Uh, it's not a narrow strip. No. Um, and and it is. Um, and the origin. Yeah. It, it. They're both Saba and Seba of Saba and Stage are both of volcanic origin. Um, and uh, Stacia of Seba doesn't have any sand. It's all deep. It's it's going steep yeah. down. And Stacia um, has sands uh, like St. Martin. Uh, that's also having sand. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. The distance is also a bit shorter than Curacao Aruba. Yeah. Curacao Saba more comparable than Saba St. Martin. That's uh, Neil, I see you raised your hand also. Yeah, um, yeah, just a, a quick response or to, to the comment of Casper. I was wondering, because you, you mentioned you're jealous uh, of the, the study. I was just wondering, like, what is uh, what is the bottleneck for, for Curacao th that you uh, don't have a study like this? Is that uh, budget or is that the policy that you mentioned before? Uh, and uh, a second question, it does re like is there also an element in research like this that may help other island states or islands um, to uh, reproduce this uh, reproduce monitoring system in a cheaper way? Like do you have 
we also have recommendations uh, as an output to other islands. Uh, that's more a question to Caroline and uh, the other speaker. I forgot her name. <laughs> Michelle. Thank you, Neil. Well, I think uh, our main, uh, well, bottleneck, our main um, challenge is, or uh, it's not actually, it's, it's basically a fact that um, our infrastructure is governed by our, uh, what we call Dienst Openbare Werke, which is falls under our Ministry of uh, Infrastructures, Urban Planning. Whereas, uh, and maybe Michel can elaborate on this a little bit better, but uh, because the Bonaire Station and Seba are special municip municipalities to the Netherlands, they just have easier opportunity and actually fall below uh, Rijkswaterstaat, as far as I know, uh, in terms of, well, not exactly, I know, yeah, but in terms of their development. And with every, and not this is not only in terms of infrastructure, but every government here, uh, there is no, um, and it doesn't mean that it, so the relationship we have with the Netherlands doesn't mean that it's not possible, but there is very little cooperation between the government of the Netherlands and the government of Curaçao in terms of infrastructure planning and such. Um, it's also, and, and apart from that, it's budget. I mean, we don't even have money to fix our roads, let, let alone long-term uh, vision of uh, this types of uh, stuff. So what I've been trying to do is, is uh, set up research, as, at least starting with students, to identify uh, our challenges and to start some kind of monitoring and uh, stuff uh, to do, to at least have, a, let's say, lay down a basis for um, for what needs to be done. On the other hand, for at least for Curaçao, I'm not sure how, and, and the, I know the maps that Misha showed about Stacia also uh, uh, show this, there is a lot of information done. I mean, there are a lot of maps. We've built uh, over a thousand dams on Curaçao. I mean, there was a lot of knowledge and we should not forget the whatever has been done already, but we should and we should use it. I mean, I think that's the other challenge we have that the new generations do not know that what is available. Now, and um, to add uh, to Casper, uh, even on Curaçao, you can find uh, a lot of information finally. If you go to the history of uh, what Shell has been doing there, you can even uh, find uh, tidal records of the 50s and of the 60s. Exactly. And, and they did their work quite ac uh, accurately. And um, I've been recently uh, involved in uh, tidal measurement at uh, CPA. Uh, at, um, um, Curacao Port Authority. Yeah. Curacao Port Authority. And they are trying as well to do it. And... Um, uh, but in general, what you see, eh, uh, doing measurements is um, uh, something that's not only related to governments, but also to uh, taking the initiative to do it. Um, and uh, in general, doing measurements, even in the Netherlands, we do it um, um, not, at, not at, at every location um, where we should do it. Yeah? Um, but also here at, uh, at Stacia and Saba, for instance, uh, it surprised me that there was no clear reference level or uh, when you uh, want to, to notice the sea level uh, rise. Um, yeah, you, uh, you saw the, the pictures about seasonal fluctuations, yearly fluctuations. It, it's not so easy to say it's three millimeters more or less. So. Um, yeah, you really need measurements for a longer time and with with a lot of accuracy if, if you want to to state this sea level rise and, and yeah, know how much it is. So sending more students uh, to Curaçao is a good idea. So Catalina, if you have some, <laughs> send them over. <laughs> Yeah. But I think also to, to, to add something on this, I think that, that is what I mean with, with, with the vision of Michel in this case. You can, I think it's, it's very important for the island if you have, uh, well, if you have budget issues and, and that, that's what we also had on Stasia. You have to make decisions. You don't have to have to, the state of the art monitoring equipment. You can do it in an, in an effective way uh, using way less costs. And I think that is what we, uh, well, what Michel uh, de designed and helped, and Deltares helped us with analysis, uh, with analysis of the data. So I think we we also 
uh, looked to, okay, how we, can we do it in an effective, cost-effective way? Yeah. Very important, especially where you have a very low budget, indeed. Yes, thank you. Um, Steve has raised his hand also. Hi, thank you. Uh, very interesting. So I wanted to ask about the, the situation in Curso and um, where there's a practice of the private developers um, building their, their own defences. And have you come across situations where neighbouring sections of coast and the property owners there have concerns about the adverse impacts of the types of of defences that the new developments are putting in and, and how do you deal with with those situations if they happen uh, i see i see michel laughing maybe he remembers something from his time on curacao i don't know but this at least brings up a uh, a situation uh, where um we have a resort uh on the coast called bawaza uh in the maripum maripumpun area it's called and the Maripompon area is a uh, along the coast. It's near to the the pictures I showed on my with the big beach that they built. And this is the most luxurious resort we have on the island. And uh, I mean the uh, Hollywood people have 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 slept there. And at the downdrift side of what they built, so they built large offshore breakwaters and islands and reclaimed part land and beaches, etc. And on the downdrift side. At the first first instance, there was nothing. Then there was some erosion, and then it caused also a beach to form. So it was a bit the the, the coastline was moving about a bit. Um, what happened at a certain point? So the local people that were living in this area, uh, not not the most privileged people, started using the, at least the beach that was formed, and using it for themselves. At a certain point, the developers then closed access to this beach, saying, "No, we built this beach. It is it is our beach," and that caused us. And at a certain point, they raided the luxurious hotel. So why am I, why am I telling this story? Because government is stayed pretty far off from the whole discussion of quite a while until it escalated. And what will then happen is that the influential, my, powerful developers on the island who know government officials, they can basically put them under pressure of of taking over, huh? of listening to them in terms and going over the parts of the local population. So it is, it does create. Let me, let me just summarize by saying these developers oftentimes, because we rely so much on tourism and development on the island, that could have a lot of influence on government and uh, it, it affects difficult situation. And, and to make it more difficult is it's often the Dutch developers against the local communities, which also has a historical uh, difficulty. That's what we experience. Yeah. That's complicated. Michel, I don't know if this was, uh, but but. Yeah, you 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 tell the story correctly, Casper. I think that you should add that um, uh, those uh, coast-related regulations of the country are uh, island-dependent. Uh, in Aruba, uh, the coast is not from a developer. The coast is from the public. And right. um, in the past, so, these discussions have been in Curaçao as well. And uh, on one way or another, those uh, resorts were able to uh, to claim parts of the coast. And uh, well, yeah. I, I, I don't think that that's a good situation, that you yeah. could claim a part of the coast. The, those are the deals being made, like I said, sometimes be, uh, not often beforehand, often after the fact, after it's done that there's deals being made. St. Martin, for example, uh, all the hotels also on the beaches, everybody's always, all St. Martin, everybody can have access to the beach, even though hotels, own, even though the beach is on a hotel or vice versa. And Curacao is different in that sense, yeah. And how is it in Scotland again, Steve? Both, a bit of both, I think, if not. Uh, sorry, yeah, um, so any anything, I mean, one of the roles that we would have is to review any development proposals for adverse impacts and in particular flooding or erosion and if there are any then it would be an objection and it would then be up to the local authority to make a decision so uh, the goes is from the local uh, local government then yeah yeah sorry yeah. local government it makes the decision but 
they would almost always go with the the no you know no adverse impact we go with that thank you i see catalan has raised her hand also that was by accident oh, okay <laughs> sorry well, you have some students available or could, could yes. be <laughs> Okay. Well, I, I can if there are projects, I'm sure there will be students interested to go to the place, but we should have good projects for them to handle, of course. Okay. But Can I'm sure, it? yeah, please uh, feel free to contact me. Yeah. All right. Hey, Grit? Yeah, yeah. So I'm switching on my camera. Hi, everybody. I have unstable connections here. We have building in the apartment. I'm sitting in Berlin, uh, Germany. And I've just tried to avoid to using too much of my capacity. I'm listening with great interest. I'm part of this group for a long time, more in the distance. I'm social scientist. Uh, and um, so I used to work with Bas Jonkman from TU Delft and with uh, Jakobus Hofstede, some of you uh, or many of you might know. But I'm always a social scientist looking on those aspects on coast from a human perspective, the so human centered perspective. And the reason for uh, listening today is also we acquired a new project, um, an horizon project, which deals with climate services and uh, standardization of those services. And we are in a moment in the scoping for potential cases, maybe also where we would like to contribute. And so I was listening with great interest to, you know, the discussion here. And I would like to discuss with my colleagues and then maybe send an email to you, Petra, for distributing to everybody who had a case here today and see if there's something we could contribute. But it's on climate services and the standardization of such services. So it's not particularly in-depth investigation on one case. We would have to think about opportunity to maybe add value to your questions by coming from a climate service perspective. I just wanted to mention it and show my face briefly. Mm -hmm. And then I discussed with my colleagues and Petra, I'm coming with an email to you and maybe we can then have a second round of discussions if we can helpful somehow to the debate um, I'm listening today, if that's okay. Of yeah? course, yes, many thanks. Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. For You're welcome. Now I'm saving only uh, the uh, um, connections, but I'm still here. <laughs> I can <laughs> listen to you and, and hear you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so yeah, maybe then it might be also of interest for you the, the, the talk that Steve had last week, together with a colleague from Wales, and the next one in Fiji. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Might be of interest yeah. for, for your call as well, maybe? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm listening, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the emails you're sending and the invitations, so I will contribute then. Okay, thank you. Very nice, very nice, yes. Because we have all been also been thinking of might it be interesting to set up some kind of platform where we can exchange ideas and lessons learned of different islands. So maybe compare the Caribbean with the Pacific mm -hmm. and with the European islands. So socially very much different and also cult the climate yeah. is very different, but the issues might not be so different. So maybe we can come up with some kind of platform and where we can help each other. Yeah. I think that's a very good idea. What we experience as social scientists, even though the landscapes <laughs> and the natural environment might be uh, different, the issues are human related are always the same, more or less. And if I'm hearing the debate about policy and, and obstacles and decision private versus public, this is very much in other places also the case. So I think there's a lot to learn and to compare. Very nice, yes. Let's keep in touch and let's think mm -hmm. book this through. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting indeed. Are there any final remarks, questions? Because I see we are already out of time. It's way too interesting to stop it earlier. <laughs> any final conclusions of ideas? No, then I would like to thank you all. Uh, we are going to upload this record recording also for our colleagues in the far, far east, and also some people have been texting and emailing, oh, I can't make it, I'm running late with another uh, discussion, and can I look it back? Well, it will be uploaded to the website of the Council of Coastal Kring, it's Coastal Kring at EU, um, probably somewhere uh, tomorrow or beginning of next week. Um, so thank you all for joining us, and thank you very much all the speakers who have been putting some effort in it to, to 
gives a very good overview and presentation of these two or three islands actually. Thank you very much and hope to see you soon in a different location for a different presentation or webinar. All right. Thank you. Thank, bye you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.